This morning, <clears throat> I appreciate, thank you, Perla, for the scripture reading. There in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, and we can go there. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That means it's good for what? For doctrine. Right? So is doctrine important? Yes. The Bible is good for doctrine. For reproof. For correction. For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. Amen. How important is the Bible? Very important. Very important. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you very much for this day and especially for your word. Open our minds and may your Holy Spirit come in. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, my question earlier was a trick question. Because Jesus is here through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. But the value that Jesus puts on Scripture is much more than the value that he put on himself. We're going to look at that today. The value that Jesus puts on Scripture is, surpasses even much more than what he puts on on himself and we're going to look <clears throat> at how the living word regards the written word so I want to take you to the book of Luke chapter 24 Luke chapter 24 here is a familiar story of two disciples on the road to Emmaus Luke chapter 24 now just as uh, as the question on which day are these two disciples traveling on the road to Emmaus? On which day of the week? On the first day, on Sunday. Very good. Okay, now how do you know that? Because it was resurrection. Good, good. The Bible tells us there at the beginning of chapter, of chapter 24 that Jesus resurrected and then there in verse 13 on that same day they're traveling and that's important that's important because on the greatest day of history for Christianity on the greatest moment in Christian history these two Christians are discouraged on, Christian, on Christians greatest history day you see, without the resurrection, what good would our faith be? No good. If Jesus would not have resurrected, as Paul says, our faith would be vain. Our faith, our faith would not be any good. It is only true and good because he resurrected. And because he resurrected and has the keys to death and we put our faith in him, we too will resurrect as well. But here on the greatest history, on the greatest day in history, not just for Christian, but for the world, for the world, these two Christians, these two disciples are discouraged. They're, 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 they're disappointed. When, and while Jesus was fulfilling his word, and how was he fulfilling his word? Well, he's resurrected and is walking among them. He's fulfilling what he has said. These two Christians were doubting his word. And too many in the church, we live on emotions and feeling rather than on the word of God. If Jesus says he will resurrect on the third day, you can count on it. He's going to resurrect on the third day. And I want to share with you from, let me see if, oh perfect, thank you. From Sanctified Alive, page 89. There it says, many who are sincerely seeking for holiness of heart and purity of life seem perplexed and discouraged. I don't know if any of you have ever felt that way. Okay? They are con constantly looking to themselves and lamenting their lack of faith. And because they have no faith, they feel what? That they cannot claim the blessings of God. Has anyone felt like that? I know I have. 
These persons mistake feeling for faith. That's very important key. We cannot get mixed up that feeling is faith. Or that faith is feeling. Because someday you may not feel good. Does that mean you have no faith? No, not, necess not, ne not ne necessarily. She continues then saying, They look above the simplicity of, truth, of true faith. Notice what she says. Is faith hard or is it simple? The simplicity of true faith. And thus bring great darkness upon their soul. They should turn their mind from self to dwell upon the mercy and goodness of God and to recount His promises and then simply what? Believe. Believe that He will fulfill His word. We are not to trust in our faith but in the promises of God. And where are the promises of God found? So how much importance even does the, does the testimony of Jesus point us to the Word of God? Very important, very important. And so, and so here these disciples, and I think that's, yes. And so here these disciples are discouraged. And too many of our lives do not reflect that we are built, that our life is built in the Word of God. Too many of our lives reflect that we are not built on the Word of God. And so there in Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 17, it says, Now behold, two men, two of the men were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they were conversing and reasoning that Jesus himself, drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are what? And are sad. And they're sad. On the greatest day of history, two Christians are discouraged and sad instead of being encouraged and happy and praising God. While they were sad, who was walking with them? Jesus was walking with them. While they were sad and maybe doubted or forgot God's word, Jesus was walking with them. Don't forget that, friends. While I moan or whine on my own problems and sad for my own things, Jesus is walking with me. Jesus is walking with me. And so what did, what did they say there in verse 21? Oh, but we were hoping that he, wa that he who was going to redeem Israel, indeed besides all, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. They even recognize that it's the third day. Yes, and certain women, I like this part. And certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early, my Bible says astonished us. Other translations say confused us. Why did they confuse him? Verse 23 says, When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. But yet they're still sad. They're still sad that even though there was testimony of these women that say, hey, you know, Jesus is alive. The angel told us that he was alive. They still, in their mind, they're confused or they're astonished. Why aren't they getting it that Jesus is alive? You see, friends, they knew, they were disciples of Jesus. They heard Jesus say over and over and there's plenty of time that Jesus says, I'm going to be turned in to the Pharisees, give my life, and on the third day, I will resurrect. You know, the enemies of Jesus remembered more than the disciples of Jesus. Did you know that? Because the enemies of Jesus, what did, what did the Pharisees do? They went over and they said, you know what, put some guards because Jesus says he was going to rise on the third day. They had remembered, and the disciples aren't 
remembering or at least aren't believing. Maybe they remember but they're not even believing. The enemies believed more and that's why they wanted to put guards to make sure that Jesus wouldn't rise or that they wouldn't take his body. And yet Jesus' own disciples had forgotten or did not believe. Friends, while we are going through sad times or hard times, don't forget that Jesus is walking right beside you. That Jesus is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. Is your marriage falling apart? Jesus is there. Amen. Are your kids high on drugs? Well. Jesus is right there. Amen. Has a doctor told you that you're sick with a disease of some kind? Jesus is right there. In the lowest moment of these disciples, they stopped believing what God had said. And Jesus in his promises and many places tells us that lo I am with you always always do we remember that do we remember that it is the little use of scripture that keeps our life from having strength Jesus has been dealing with this problem for a long time he's been trying to move believers from just being a spoon-fed church to a Bible knowledge and a Bible believing church friends Turn to Mark. You know, even in Jesus' time, people neglected the reading of Scripture. Mark chapter 12, verse 10. Mark chapter 12, verse 10. Jesus here says, Have you not read the Scriptures? The stone which is the builder which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. This comes from Psalms 118 and Jesus is reminding them, haven't you read the Bible? That this is supposed to happen. And he also even says in, in Matthew 22, 29, Jesus answered and said to them, are you mistaken not knowing the scripture and the power of God? This is, this is the verse where they ask Jesus that uh, when a person resurrects, who are they going to be married to if they were married to different people? while they were here on earth. And Jesus, what does he say? Haven't you read the Bible? My favorite one there is in Matthew 21, 42. Jesus again said to them, did you never read the scriptures? Did you never read the scriptures? See, some of the stuff that we suggest or that we say gives evidence that we are not reading the Bible gives evidence that we are not reading the Bible. And I'm surprised when a Seventh-day Adventist who has been in the church over 50 years asks questions that they should already know the answers for. Jesus placed emphasis in the study of the Word. And so, going back to Luke 24, Luke, Luke 24, what does Jesus do? Does Jesus say, I'm right here, I'm alive. Luke 24, 25. How does Jesus deal with them? Could Jesus have said, hey, fellas, let not your heart be troubled. I'm right here. And they would have been happy. But Jesus, Jesus doesn't do that. He restrains. And verse 25, Luke 24, verse 25. On the contrary, he kind of rebuked them. He says, oh, foolish ones. And slow of heart to believe in what? In all that the prophets have spoken. Oh, slow of heart and not believing the Bible. And not believing the scriptures. Verse 26. Ought not the chief, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And verse 27 says exactly what he does. He doesn't even reveal himself. Verse 27 says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the what? The scriptures concerning himself. Where does he take them to? He takes them to the word of God. He takes them to the word of God, friends. He turns them to scriptures. They haven't done their biblical homework or maybe don't haven't believed in it but sometimes 
Friends, sometimes God allows trauma in our lives not to move us to tears, but to move us to the, to the scriptures. Amen. Sometimes God allows certain things to happen, not because he's happy that we suffer. No, 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 no. But maybe that's the only way we turn to God. Don't raise your hands, but how many have been through that, that a crisis happens and you find yourself in scripture? You find yourself kneeling and praying to God. Instead of crying, let's read the Bible. And as we read here earlier, claim the promises of God and believing that God is going to fulfill His word. F believing that God is going to fulfill His word. Jesus doesn't turn to them and say, it's me. He says, look at the word. Look at the word. And you know why He does that? Because he knew, he knew that his disciples weren't always going to have Jesus visible and touchable. We today don't have Jesus visible and touchable, do we? No. But what do we have? We have the Holy Spirit and even also the Word of God. The Word of God. See, I, I sometimes occasionally tell Salid, you know, I need a new Bible. And I've actually, you know, as soon as this one starts a little bit to getting unglued or, or torn, I'm already thinking, I, I need a new Bible. And uh, her response is always the same. You have lots of Bibles. <laughs> so I asked her yesterday, I asked her yesterday, you know what, count for me how many Bibles I have. And she counted 23 Bibles. And that's at home. I have a couple here in the office as well that I have so about 25 to 26 Bibles. And not, and not two of them are the same. They're different translations or a different language as well. And even in, even in the different language, there are different translations as well. And the reason why I bring that up, friends, and, and it's a rebuke to me, but also to some of us who have Bibles. What does God require for somebody who has 23 Bibles at home? <laughs> what does God require for a person? Forget, you know, forget the fact that I am a minister even, even more, but just a person who has 23 Bibles at home. You know, maybe I should stop saying I need another Bible <laughs> and start reading the ones I have more. What does God require for those that just have maybe just one Bible and a Sabbath school quarterly? Thank you. To study it. To read it. Now, what does God require for someone who has a Bible? Let's say you only have one Bible. And you pray the same prayer for, a, and you pray, and you pray the, the same prayer that another person prays who has no Bibles. Okay, what does God require for us that have a Bible or Bibles, and we pray a prayer or the same prayer of another person who has no Bible? He expects those who have the Bible to read it. To read his word. To read his word. If you turn to the meditation there in your bulletin, Desire of Ages, page 796. It says, beginning at Moses, the very alpha of Bible history, Christ expounded in all the scriptures the theme concerning himself. He had first made he, no, had he first made himself known to them, their hearts would have been satisfied. In the fullness of their joy, they would have hungered for nothing more. But it was necessary, notice this, it was necessary for them to understand the witness born to him by the types and prophecies of the Old Testament. It was necessary for them to see it in scripture. Upon these, their faith must be established. 
Friends, upon this, our faith must be established. We don't need a miracle. We don't need a, uh, uh, something visible to see. We need to go and believe the word of God. Christ performed no miracle to convince them, but it was his first work to, notice this, his first work to explain the scriptures. And as we begin tomorrow night, it is our first work to bring the people the word of God. And that's it. My opinion means nothing. They had looked upon his death as the destruction of all their hopes. Now he showed them from the prophets that this was the very strongest evidence for their faith. Friends, your faith must be established on the word of God. You can eat from this table today. You can drink from this table today. But your faith must be established on the word of God. Are you praying for a miracle? How many of you are praying for a miracle? I encourage you to go read the Bible. To read the Bible and live your life accordingly to what you're reading. You see, if he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, what should we seek first? Lord, I need a car, and we, 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 we pray for the car first. Lord, I need a job, we pray for the job first. But God says, seek righteousness first. And everything else, God says, I will provide, I will take care of it. So go to the word of God and live according to it. And I want to share here from child guidance of knowing of, of understanding that we can't disregard applying the Word of God to our hearts. There, it is our privilege to come to Him with holy boldness as, is, as in sincerity we ask Him to let His light shine upon us. He will hear and answer us. But we must live in harmony with our prayers. Amen. They are... They are of no avail if we walk contrary to them. So we don't only pray, but we need to live. We need to live what we pray. We need to live what the Word of God says. And notice, I have seen. I have what? Seen. Okay, so she's seen this. I have seen a father who after reading a portion of scripture and offering prayer would often almost as soon as he had risen from his knees begin to what? Scold his children. And notice her, her question. How could God answer the prayer he had offered? And if after scolding his children a father offers prayer, does that prayer benefit the children? What does she say? No. Unless what? It is a prayer of confession to God. It is a prayer of confession to God. Friends, we can't pray and disregard applying the Word of God into our lives. We read the Word of God. We pray, but we need to follow and live up to what God says. What God says. And maybe some of us today need to Say like Jeremiah, well, there where he says in Jeremiah 15, 16, your words were found and I ate them. And I ate them. So the most important thing in your house, the most important thing in your house, friends, is the word of God. Amen. It is our source, our strength. You know, without the word of God, we wouldn't know what to do here. Without the word of God, we wouldn't be here this day. Without the word of God, you wouldn't know that God loves you. Yes. We owe everything to the scriptures, friends. Your salvation. You know, Jesus says, I am the word. And the word became flesh. Now, don't take this the wrong way. But we don't necessarily need Jesus here. Physically. Do we? Do we? No. What was it that made Jesus powerful? Was it his physical body? It was his words. It was his words that he says when he says, 
Daughter or son, your sins are forgiven. Rise up and walk. Lazarus, come forth. You are healed. It was his words. And do we have his words today? They are all right here. They were all right here. Even in the days of Jesus, he was there physically. But it didn't profit many unless those that listened to his words. So as you partake this morning in the emblems of the Lord's holy body, the living word, which is right here, I encourage you and invite you to partake of the written word every day. Every day. That just as Jesus shared with these, these disciples the importance, he put the word of God above himself. He could have said, hey, it's me. No, but he put priority more in taking them to the word of God. So as we partake this morning in the living word, the body, the emblems which represent the body of our Savior, let's also partake in the written word every day. That is my prayer and desire. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, as we prepare to partake in these emblems, Lord, please help us not to disregard and forgive us when we have disregarded in reading your word and we read other dumb things. Bring us closer to you and we only get closer to you through the reading of your word and prayer. So now, Bless your church as we participate in the ordinance of foot washing and the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we will be dismissed to participate in the ordinance of foot washing, which will be in the Family Life Center. There, there is space and room for single men, single ladies, and married couples as well. So uh, I invite you to join us there as we prepare with the foot washing and then we will come back here to participate of the, of the Lord's Supper.